Welcome to the uh, February 2023 uh, SJAA Imaging SIG meeting. And tonight I'm going to speak, and it's hi, Mervite. I'm going to speak about things I learned in the past year. Uh, we've had several meetings of, uh, you know, helping them, teaching us at least, you know, four by Francesco. Alex has given a talk, and there may be others. I've, uh, oh, Dave Payne gave two presentations. And uh, there's also, uh, so I've learned a lot from those talks, and hopefully I haven't missed. But I probably have missed a few from those two. And, um, and lots of new software has come out uh, uh, in the past year or two uh, in image processing. And um, well, as, as I mentioned in the introduction uh, that I published to this talk, um, I had some time to reprocess some images. I did the reprocessing and I found that my newly processed images were a lot nicer to my eye than than the ones that I had been pretty happy with uh, previously, uh, much to my surprise, honestly. And so um, I wound up reprocessing one and then I wound up reprocessing the second and then the third and so on and so forth. I wound up spending like all of January, you know, reprocessing at least 20 images and I sent that out and I encourage you uh, in the first, you know, five minutes of this talk, I'm going to put those images up. Uh, you can look at them over Zoom, but uh, if, feel free to uh, click on the link that's on the meetup page and you'll see, um, uh, you know, maybe you could see them at higher resolution if you just click through that link and see them on Google Photos. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. Let's see, and uh, find that page. Okay, so I uh, assume I'm sharing my screen, and if I'm not, somebody interrupt me. And I'll go to this uh, page here, which is um, my before and after astrophotography image. And the first three images, I'm going to show you our M13, uh, NGC 891, and Triangulum. And those are the three that I'm also going to reprocess in detail. Uh, you know, hopefully not too much time on each image, but I'm going to go more detail in them. But uh, here I think I have 20 images in this uh, slideshow. So if you click on, I'm going to click on the first image and then use the arrow key to advance from one image to another. And you'll, in all cases, the first image of a particular object you see is the old version, um, you know, done without Blur X, done without uh, the general hyperbolic stretch, done without the, uh, what is that called again? The, the, the new color uh, processing uh, scheme. And uh, what uh, what other uh, I forget what other, but anyway, uh, oh, done without weighted by badge processing. SPCC was the thing I forgot. Anyway, and then maybe just the things I've learned from these talks in the past year. And then the second one is my you know revised image that I did in January. And so here you go. Here's M thirteen. Uh, you know, a nice big cluster. The, by the way, uh, un unless I say it otherwise, they're all shot with my 10 inch RC. So the the uh, the width of the image is about half an, a degree. So, uh, you know, a pretty long setup, not planetary, but longer than, you know, a 100 or 130 refractor. And anyway, you could see here, uh, here's uh, M13, which I used to be happy with, but a much sharper version of M13 after reprocessing. Um, and not only sharper with the stars being tinier, but little galaxies like the one in the upper right uh, is, is, uh, has more detail, is clearer. And if you go on to something like a eight NGC 891 like this, you could see it's also stretched better. You know, there's there's just more of the glow from the galaxy. 
I have nicer, more colorful stars. I don't know, you may agree or disagree in my taste for how much color I put in my stars, but to my eye, at least if you want to put this kind of color in and uh, and uh, so on, uh, you, you can, or at least I was able to uh, post these improvements. I'm sure there are people that could have done all this without these improvements, but at least uh, at my level of processing definitely has improved. Here's triangulum. I should, th this is the one image I believe, there may be two, but anyway, this is one of two images in this um, slideshow that were done on my old refractor, a 105. This is, I believe, the only image that has any uh, dark sky data. Francesco and I went down to Pinnacles like in 2019, one weekend. Or, and uh, and uh, this was an image that I shot. Uh, part of the data came from that, and then more came from home. Uh, all the rest of the images uh, are data that came from home. I live behind Silic uh, behind uh, Stanford, so it's you know uh, better skies than downtown San Jose or downtown San Francisco, but far from dark skies. Um, you can't see the Milky Way or anything like that from my house. It's, uh, I think it's uh, five is the uh, designation. But anyway, so that's the old version of Triangulum. And that's the new version of Triangulum, just much more definition on the galaxy. You know, again, much better stretched, I think. Uh, certainly much tighter stars, uh, nice color, I believe, so on and so forth. You can agree or disagree, but that that's the way I see it. And uh, again, here's a sombrero that I was proud of. And then in my humble opinion, a much better sombrero um, taken. Uh, you know, all these things are the same data. Data has not changed. So the same fits files. Uh, in many cases, I didn't redo the pre-processing. In some cases I did. Um, and, but there you go. Um, has a few more. This is a, an image I actually shot pretty recently at the end of 2022 and processed it then, but now with these new techniques. And then uh, I was able to get, you know, just, I don't know, I think a more interesting view of the Stefan's Quintet gal uh, galaxies in the center of this and the stars and all the little objects in this image. Again, ARP 273, uh, same idea. Uh, I forget when this one's name is, but it's it's a very nice little galaxy. Um, uh, and I'll I'll stop with this uh, final one. I is this uh, is this cocoon? I forget. But um, uh, anyway, you could see that the cloud. Uh, here is, uh, you know, there's more detail about it. This object here, uh, ne little blue nebula, I guess a reflection nebula in the lower left, isn't even, if you go back to the first version, it's hard to even see. And I guess it's this sort of area here. I didn't do a good job of finding it and all of a sudden it popped out. I wasn't looking for it. I didn't process it in order to pop that out, but poof, uh, I think the GHS scheme helps a lot with all that. So as the, you know, that's my introduction, my motivation uh, for this. So what, what I'm going to do is go through, um, well, let me, let me switch to my slides here. Um, I'll start this slideshow. And uh, I guess I didn't say it, but if you want to see basically all these uh, images are, uh, are in my astro bin as well. So you just user slash HY, hi. Um, and you can find them there as well as in that slideshow. So as I said before, they're uh, almost all except for uh, triangulum, maybe only except for triangulum. It's noted in the, uh, um, in the Google Photos album uh, where things are shot, but almost all are shot from home. Most of them, not all of them, are LRGB. Some there's a few RGBs, uh, and then uh, sometimes I added HA data. There's no narrow band, you know, um, O3 and S2 
stuff. It's just they're all either RGB plus L or plus L and plus R H A or just anyway, you get the idea. More and more, I'm shooting uh, long, you know, lots of data because I have a pretty stable setup at home. More or less, I know how to use my imaging software. I, I'm one of the developers of KSTARS. I use KSTARS. It's pretty stable for me. And so, you know, if the night has any promise at all, I will just go outside, uh, uncover my telescope. I leave it there covered typically. Just uncover it, go back inside, and uh, either if I've already imaged an object, more or less, it takes me a minute to bring things up and hit start again, and it'll image. Or uh, if I haven't, it may take you know half hour to set up the uh, image or whatever. But it's pretty easy to image, so I tend to image on you know mediocre nights through great nights. I tend to image. Maybe not on a totally full moon, but not far from a full moon. So I, I tend to gather a lot of data, and I hope that the weighted batch processing and my blinking of the data uh, eliminates, you know, the bad stuff. Um, as I said, my uh, my setup right now is a, a ten inch RC, so it has about a half arc minute is the width of the image. So the the image in the background here, the M thirteen is uh is like you said like i say about a half uh, a degree um and then i haven't been i'm not one to optimize on exposure time somehow i've settled on four minute exposures for my rgb and narrow band and a half that for a luminosity channel uh and about half my data when i'm shooting lrgb or LRGBHA is about half the data, you know, half the acquisition time is shooting the Ls. Um, that's some people uh, buy into that, some people don't. Next week, uh, next month, I should say, Alex is going to give a presentation where he discusses where maybe uh, shooting L isn't worth it. And can't wait to hear about that. But uh, for now, on this presentation, that's what I did. And uh, it makes sense to me uh, that you get more photons that way. I, I will say that my luminosity filter, my L filter, is not one that has a lot of uh, notches out uh, you know, of it to get rid of light pollution. It isn't a light pollution removing filter. It's pretty much the full uh, you know, red, green, blue bandwidth you know, put the ord together, shall I say. Okay, so what I do is um, shoot, and then I have a big collection of data, and I can have 20 hours worth of data, 30 hours worth of data, a lot of data, but like I say, some of it may not be all that good, and my first step is to go through the data and just throw out the obvious junk. So obvious junk is, you know, really nasty satellite or airplane lines through the files right or um i don't know when i have do problems it's really obvious there's an m82 uh sub that's actually a keeper but i didn't uh, prepare this for this talk but i'm sure when i blinked through my m82 data um there were things where you could barely you know you had similar you know you just didn't see the m82 right so i wouldn't have kept that I probably threw out, I don't know, 10% of the data through Blink. Uh, I don't know if that's a good number, but something, you know, it, it wasn't 50% and it wasn't, you know, two files out of 800. It was, uh, let, let's call it that. So I go and I, I just load up all the images for the target and Blink through. I use this top one. So, uh, this top a control on blink which tells blink to you know so to basically set the screen transfer function so that you can see each image well and that's uh what i do and that's a manual obviously uh, a manual uh, thing and then move on to weighted batch pre-processing i didn't used to use 
I, I heard a lot of people talk about WBPP, and I don't know. I felt like I could do a better job uh, pre-processing data on my own using the kind of techniques I learned, you know, year, you know, three years ago when I was starting out. I found I was wrong that this does a great job and it's totally automated and it saves me a lot of time. So I'm a convert. I'm that's what I do. And, and as an example, I have the statistics on the left here for a project I recently did on M82. Um, uh, I didn't bring up a picture of MA2. It was an object I was happy with the results for. It was an LRGBHA object, and I shot a lot of it. I just, I, I, I just, there were a lot of nights in December, or I think it was December and January, I, where um, I don't know. I just turned on the uh, the scope, and when that was up, I took pictures of it. It was probably up several hours a night, and I just kept on shooting and wound up collecting 46 hours, as you see here. This is 46 hours post blink. So let's say I collected, for the sake of argument, 50 hours, and I blinked out the, the you know, four of them. And I wound up with 46 hours of LRGB, which is, as you can see here, 651 two minute L exposures. And then, you know, on the order of uh, 100 uh, RGB HA exposures. The reason they're not the same, because I do, uh, the, the software tries to get the same number of RGB and HAs, um, is, is totally uh, damaged data, uh, at least for the RGB. Maybe the HA was a little different. I may have started HA later. But... Um, you know, there were just a lot of bad blues for, I don't know what reason, just got unlucky. So that's a lot of data. Um, that's a lot of files, and it takes uh, a long time to run all those things you run when you calibrate your images. So you could see here, it took 10 hours for weighted batch processing to, uh, to process this data. Uh, but that's okay. I sleep overnight and it works overnight. And so as long as you learn how to set your laptop to, you know, not turn itself off when you're idle for a half hour, you can run, um, you can run WBPP and it will, you know, you wake up in the morning and there's, uh, or okay, maybe you got to wait for your shower and breakfast, but then at some point soon there's, uh, there are your uh, pre-processed uh, images, which is great. In this case, it took 200 gigabytes ballpark of, of disk space to do this. So not only it takes 10 hours, but 200 gigabytes for this amount of data. It's a lot of data, admittedly, but that, but that, there you go. And uh, really, it's very little setup time. I'm going to show, and, and when, once I switch over to PixInsight, the setup for that, but not obviously let things like that run. So anyway, after WPP, I have uh, you know four or five, um, four or five uh, master you know channel monochrome uh, images, and uh, I don't exactly use the luminosity image straight as it is. I make a synthetic L. Francesco and I work this scheme out. Um, I think mostly Francesco. And uh, the scheme basically pulls some illuminance out of the RGB data as well. Uh, you have, a, I had a lot of RGB data, so why not use that, the luminance inside that data? Uh, and I'll describe how that's done. And then after that, I just have a sequence of, of uh, operations to generate an LRGB you know, a, a color image and running over that quickly. There's, uh, you know, you put the R and G and B together. I'm going to do this in detail, but just to say it in 30 seconds, put that stuff together, the usual um, DBE technique for uh, getting rid of gradients and finding the color, uh, you know, setting the color right, the, the exterminator uh, plugins, 
combining the uh, luminance with the RGB and then operating, uh, you know, if the image, most of my images do, if the image calls for it, separating out the main target from the stars and stretching those separately and then combining them back together and then often uh, dealing with a, a color cast in the background. Most of my images don't have a lot of, uh, you know, um, clouds, shall we call them, in the background. And, and so I'm really looking, uh, or, or if they do, I don't pull them out uh, as well as I might. This isn't the typical narrow band, you know, uh, image of, of those kinds of things. So they're more or less images like this. Um, let's see here. Um, I, as part of this is, is uh, stretching the stars separately, as I pointed out. And there you go. I'm not going to say that again, but that's this is this slide is just what I said. Um, often I touch things up in Lightroom at the end, so I do my best job in Pix Insight. But then I don't know to make the image a little more contrasty uh, adjustments like that. I'll I'll have uh, uh, Lightroom touch ups, Photoshop touch ups. So there you go. So um, let's talk about weighted batch processing. Um, but before I do, since I've, uh, whoops, one second. I wanna get back to the Zoom screen. So where is that? Oh, I know. Can somebody, um, I can't seem to find Zoom. Can somebody uh, speak up and let me know that things are going okay? We see your, your window being dragged around. Okay, so things are okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I somehow lost the screen where, I guess it's because I'm sharing. So things are go good. I'll go back to where uh, my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, okay. One of the deficits of Zoom is, is it, when you're sharing, you don't see what the other people are seeing. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's probably the confusion I had. So this is again weighted batch process pre-processing. I'm just mentioning it because it was a technique that was valuable to me. I don't think it improved in a big way these images, but as long as I was giving this presentation, I know I was a laggard and switching over to it. So I'll mention this. So this is what I do. This is uh, a more complicated uh, version, you know, uh, kind of uh, image for WBPP. So that's why I picked it as an example. And uh, what you see here uh, is just the directory, a directory structure, a bunch of file, how I organize files. And uh, you can see I have a directory or a folder, whatever word you like to use, called P for free processing, I guess, uh, M82. And I made four folders inside of it, all starting with uppercase session and then a number. And I broke up the data that I shot, you know, after I cleared it through Blink into four parts. Uh, and I'll explain why four parts. So these two sessions, uh, one and two, were the two, two sets of subs, basically related to two sets of flats that I took. So um, there were basically, I don't know, three weeks or four weeks that I shot uh, this object. And I only take a, a set of flats every week or so. I don't know, lazy. Uh, so um, there you go. And here you go. December 13th, I took flats. And these uh, images starting on December 14th of M82 are in this folder. So the red, green, blue, and luminance of M82 shot, you know, in the ballpark of December 14th are here. Here are the flats shot on December 13th. Uh, and these are a set of older 
um, darks that I took at the same gain, uh, which was 75 for my ASI 1600, that, you know, these flats and these subs were taken. And similarly, in session two, I must have stopped imaging. I think I stopped imaging, you know, a week before New Year's, and then I picked it up again on January 19th. And again, here's my January 19th flats and my image data for, you know, probably a week later for that week and a, another week or two, and the same darks as before. And uh, what WBPP does is it, you know, it, it will process these flats with these uh, darks and these, you know, subs with these flats and darks and so on. And, and I didn't know previous, but now I do, how to deal with multiple sets of uh, flats and so on. And then the reason I have a session three and four is just because the HA data is taken at a different gain. So since I used gain 139 for the uh, narrow band, I didn't, you know, that's incompatible with the 75 dark. So um, I just separate out the HA data from the LRGB data. And it's again, this is December, this is January. So all you got to do is, um, set up your directory like that. And then there's only one or two other things and you can run weighted batch processing. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. And then after I show you that, I'm gonna process, uh, I think just the first three of these, M13, 891 and M33, and hopefully I can get through them quickly. And then voila. So let me switch over to PixInsight. I, there's a question uh, in the chat before uh, okay. the site. Sure. Uh, uh, Richard is asking uh, what proportions of your uh, subs from a session are flats versus darks versus uh, lights? Okay. Um, what I do, and uh, I may be a lazy one, is I'll shoot flat. Uh, I mean, keep in mind that I don't move my telescope. So it's in the back, it's covered up. And so I'm not setting up my telescope. I know Richard goes on his roof and and resets his telescope up every time he images. So he may want to take flats every time he images. But well, I don't. I, I, sorry, I think I was only asked a question. I'm probably not the Richard you're thinking of because I'm new to the group. <laughs> I can't, un oh, I couldn't understand you, but the little I got was that you're not the Richard I'm thinking of. So sorry about that. Yeah, In any event, <laughs> um, There's a different Richard who spoke on planetary, who I know does that. Oh, my so, bad. Uh, the question was from uh, Richard Seeley. Okay, so sorry about that, uh, Richard. In any event, since my scope is, you know, not moving around a lot, I'm covering it and uncovering it up. I don't feel the need to take new flats every uh, image session. So I will take flats and then uh, image with them for a week, unless something changed, uh, you know, like the, the, the camera rotated relative to something, you know, so, something changed. But if my optics are staying the same, I'm not retaking my flats for a week or so. And then maybe next week I'll take them again. And I typically take 25 flats for each filter that I'm going to shoot with. So 25 green, red, blue, luminance, HA in this case. Um, darks I shoot like once a year. Uh, you know, I get the telescope in a dark place and I know, you know, I, I have to, I mean, it'll probably be a night when there's a full moon out and I'll just shoot, you know, at, at all gains that I typically use and all exposures I typically use. And I just, you know, and then I run through the processing of those darks and I save the masters and there you go. And then I reuse that for the next year or so. Um, anyway, that's what I've been doing. I'm not saying I'm the final authority on that, but, and then, you know, the image, I don't know. 
depends on the object how many subs uh, take you know something like a cluster where you're basically imaging stars you probably don't need as much as some kind of dim nebula uh you know but uh it, it shows you on my slideshow what i did but again my situation is 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 i'm shooting in suburban skies so i need more light than let's say if you were shooting at pinnacles you know probably an order of magnitude more if not more than that and uh Anyway, if that answers the question, that's my point of view. Anybody else want to uh, pipe up on that? Feel free. Uh, that's okay with me. All right. Well, if nobody, if somebody pipes up later, that's great. But I'll go on since I haven't heard anything. So I was going to show a little bit about weight, weighted batch processing and then move on to um, this image here. So uh, weighted batch pre-processing is here under scripts, batch processing, weighted batch pre-processing. If you pull it up, like I just did, and wait, here it goes. I'm going to reset it because I guess I left it working. Um, and you can see here, well, first thing I would do is I click on directory down here. No, let me tell you what. First thing I do is I make sure that I have this keyword here, session. You saw how I organized my data by these directories that had the word session in it. So you want to make sure that if you use that convention, you know, of course, the word itself doesn't matter. You just have to be consistent. But anyway, so you could see here I have grouping by keyword selected with session. And I showed you how my data was. And then all I'm going to do is find that directory, which is conveniently already here. And, you know, these are the directories that I showed you earlier. And I hit open and weighted batch pre-processing just ingests all that data. You could see it says there's 1,273 images it's going to ingest. That's more than the number of subs that, that I just showed you because of all the flats. So it's ingesting the subs and the flats and the master darks. The darks, it isn't going to build because they've already been built. But there you go. It read them all. If I hit run, um, it will take 10 hours. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could abort it, but it would take 10 hours to run. Uh, if you hit diagnostics, you could see that uh, this is the amount of data it expects. It expects to use 141 gigabytes or 140 gigabytes of scratch space plus the existing data over there. But anyway, if I did run that, it would come uh, in the morning or whenever with um, you know the images I could need to start doing the techniques I'm about to show you. Anyway, that's weighted batch pre-processing. I'm a convert. So I wanted to show you this image. You may recall, you know, this is the, you know, better looking uh, M13. And I'll show you how I got there. So we'll run through a single uh, pre-processing. The first thing I wanted to do was um, go through how I, hey, maybe I'll do that on the second image. We'll just do a straight process of this. So it says talking right over the uh, linear fit <laughs> that I wanted to start with. So the first thing I do is um, is linear fit my channels together. Um, so we're going to find linear fit. It's funny how that uh, that's Murphy's law. So. I know that my green channel is typically the strongest channel. So I'm going to linear fit the other channels to green. So um, here's my blue, here's my red, not my luminance, but the green, red, and blue. And I just say linear fit these guys. Um, and it makes the three channels the same uh, rough strength or wh whatever the right word for that is. And then I'm going to combine the red, green, and blue channels together. And 
Let's see. Let's see. And there you go. And so there's a rough combination. Doesn't look very colorful, but um, uh, there you go. And we're going to improve the color. I then uh, use Francesco scheme, uh, often use it anyway, of uh, just getting rid of the edges because of dithering and whatnot. And usually I haven't shot where it's that important to me to get all the way up to the edge and uh, wind up with uh, this, this crop of, of uh, M13. The next step would be to get rid of gradients. And what you could see here is uh, DBE, but this one is set up for this image to save time. And, you know, I don't want DBE to be fooled and think there's, you know, that this is a gradient in the center when it's really, of course, the, the star cluster. So I've, I've set things up this way. You know, you can, you can add points, you can uh, remove points by selecting them and hitting uh, delete like that and so on. But anyway, um, and then I'm just going to run the dynamic background extraction on, on the color and the uh, synthetic luminance that uh, I'll talk about on the next one. And there you go. Uh, this is um, done for the color. And it's hopefully uh, has uh, fewer gradients than we had before. And I can't find, well, I can do it this way. Where's my, oh, uh, where is my L? I guess I'm gonna use this guy if I'm not gonna demonstrate how to build it. So let me move him to the start. One second, sorry. So here, here is this uh, luminance image, and I am going to crop him. And then I'm going to run the same dynamic background uh, extract off of him. And there you go. And, and we have that. So at this point, I run the two. Um, Oh no, at this point, I wanna color correct the RGB image. And once you've cropped and stuff like that, you've lost your, um, uh, what's the word? You know, the RA deck position rotation. And so you have to solve the image again. And under scripts, uh, image analysis, you'll find image solver and you can run that and uh, solve your image. Whoops. Well, hold on. Maybe I'm running it. No, no, you have to click uh, the OK button because it's a script, not an object. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Francesco. You know, normally I just drag this icon over. This icon is the script saved, and so I almost never run it. Yeah, it's very from the menu. <laughs> so that's why I got full. Cool. Thank you very much. All right, and the script solved. And once the script is solved, now you can get better colors by running your SPCC, your spectrophotometric color calibration using all the defaults. Uh, here you go. Hi, can I ask you why the default? You have a specific filters, right? Not the generic uh, Sony color sensor. This is a mono. Well, I thought I had a Sony color sensor. Maybe, you know, so this is something you can teach me, but uh, I assume that the 16, 100 was a Sony color sensor. Which one would you recommend? Well, you have astronomics, right? The astronomics are there in the, in the database. Oh, I see. So I assume that this was talking about the sensor. Does the 1600 yeah, have an MM or an MC after it? MM. Then it's mono. Right. So you're saying you uh, figure out which astronomic filter. Okay, well, right. I will uh, look at that. Okay, but anyway, for now we're doing this one. Um, thank you. And, uh, but I will say that 
The one thing that can sometimes hit me here is if my image for whatever reason is lower quality than some, um, you won't see this nice uh, line. You know, you'll see much more of a scatter or you'll see very few points. And if that's the case, I often uh, push this later on in the processing to, you know, after the noise removal or such, or, you know, um, anyway. But in this case, it, it looked fine. And now we'll go, uh, so that's just done on the RGB image, which I'm gonna now rename as RGB. And, um, and then we're gonna blur X and noise X, uh, both the uh, RGB as well as the uh, luminance image. And so, and you could see how, you know, the stars got a lot tighter and all that. That's the magic of Blur X. And similar for, uh, for this, for the luminance image. Now, uh, the next step in this, that's done. The next step in this is to combine the luminance and RGB data and uh, using this LRGB combination process and PixInsight. Now, that's supposedly, you're, you're supposed to do that in, on, on nonlinear images, but I wanna, I wanna wind up with a, a, a linear image because I'm gonna do my stretching after I do that. So, you're still uh, unmuted, Francesco. Uh, so what I do is an inverted, an invertible stretch. So if you look at this uh, histogram stretch, uh, the shadows and the, and the highlights are you know zero and one, but the midtones is a 0.02, which you can invert. It's just a curve and you can run the inverse curve on it. So that's what I do. I, I stretch both these guys so that they become nonlinear. And then I run uh, LRGB combination with the synthetic, uh, just, just, I'm just going to add the synthetic image uh, back into the, R, uh, you know, to make it the luminance for the RGB image. And I'm using uh, Francesco's suggestions for the uh, saturation value and the chrominance noise reduction that he gave a few months back. So I'm just going to do that. And then uh, invert that stretch that I talked about earlier. And uh, here you go, voila. Um, and, and that's the STF. And that's what a typical uh, you know, uh, image will look like. All of a sudden with all the stretching and noise reduction and whatnot, you wind up seeing, I mean, the STF is, really bringing out the noise in the background. But fortunately, that stuff tends to go away. But anyway, so this is a pre-stretched image just using the STF on it. Um, the, I, I recently found out that uh, a good idea would have been to make sure that the L and the RGB is roughly the same level as the synthetic L that we're using uh, when doing this. And that's something I've started doing. but. It's not going to be part of this presentation. Um, okay, so let's at this point uh, remove the star or separate the stars. Oh, no, 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 no. This is my cluster. Oh, but luckily it didn't work anyway. This is a cluster. So of course there are only stars here. So I'm not going to do that on this image. All I'm going to do here is, is stretch and, and we'll see. So let's stretch it. So first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the auto stretch because this GHS doesn't want to see that. And we're going to use what David Payne taught us uh, last month about um, how to remove sort of uh, at least part of the um, uh, offset that the image has. So if, if you look here, you could see that there's a lot of nothing and then there, an image starts, 
Uh, Payne taught us that if you click here, hit send to SP, set the protect highlights down to zero, I mean, to as low as it goes anyway, and then uh, move this back all the way to the left. If you increase the stretch factor at that point, you can sort of move the image all the way to the left. So I do that, just not to waste any pixels, I guess. And that's, uh, I don't know if it's necessary. It seems like a good idea. And now it starts the real stretching. So to start the real stretching, you click the real time preview, you put your uh, symmetry point, you know, near this peak here, click send to SP, and then uh, play with the stretch factor, local intensity, and symmetry point fundamentally uh, is the scheme that I've uh, grown to love. And so, I don't know, you wind up with your favorite numbers. My favorite numbers for images like this tend to be in this kind of ballpark. Here, we'll uh, pick something like that. D David showed us how he uh, looks at the curve here and adjusts it. I honestly have been just looking at the picture. Um, so let's do that. Uh, here's a, what seems like a reasonable start. Oh, by the way, just uh, qualitatively, this local, you know, the, qualitatively, the stretch factor, right? You know, the more to the right you go, the brighter things go, of course. And the local intensity seems to be like a flatter image if you're to the right, whereas, you know, you move it more to the left, at least till you get to zero. Um, the brighter things get even brighter, you know, it seem how, somehow emphasizes the brightness, the brighter. Uh, that's what I would say qualitatively when I wind up in middle grounds like this, let's say. And, um, and then what I do is I play with the, uh, I adjust the SP symmetry point so that you know, if you bring it to the left, you're getting more background. If you bring it to the right, you know, your background is getting darker, which is good. But you don't want your background so dark that you start losing detail in your image, you know, like hiding parts that you really want to see. So that's sort of an eye thing. And I'm just going to go around here. And this image is close to done just by doing that. So the only, uh, there you go, I'm just going to, that's all the stretching I'm going to do in that. I'm going to get rid of the real-time preview. And here's my stretched star cluster. Honestly, it's, it's uh, close to a final image for me. Maybe I would do some Lightroom adjustments or something like that. The only other thing that I tend to do, and I'm going to demonstrate it right here, is um, desaturate the background. So I don't know if it is a byproduct of, you know, a poor imaging or what, but I tend to get, like this image has red, you know, in the background, the background is red. A little bit, but noticeable to me and noticeable enough that I want to do something about it. So um, what I do is honestly just use the process, which is desaturate along with a mask that masks out all the bright things in the image. So I'm going to do that just to demonstrate how I do that. So to do that, I take my here's my image. I'm going to extract the uh, luminance from it. And so here it is. I'm, I want to turn this into a mask. So I want to exaggerate it a little bit. So I find the histogram um, transform here on this image. And oh, 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 I see I have to reset it. And I uh, pull up. Well, where? where oh, I haven't uh, found it yet. And there it is. So I'll pull the black point up to the distribution here. I'll pull the white point down. And there's my ugly looking mask, but that's just what I'm looking for. That's close enough to be a saturation mask for my um, for the way I process. And so there you go. We're gonna, so this is my mask. 
There is my RGB data. I'm just going to take my RGB image under mask, select mask, and select that and invert that mask. And there it is. And then one sec, I find I have the saturation tool here. I raise the range to 10, believe it or not. And I'm going to do this to about minus eight if I find it, and apply it. There you go, done. And that's it for this image. I'll get rid of the mask. And there you go. So now my background is black. I still have my colorful, uh, oh, you know, there's one other thing I wanna do on this image that I find, uh, which is interesting, is despite the fact that I got rid of that sort of offset, um, let's see here, if I go to histogram transform and I look at this image, you'll see that there's a lot of nothing at the start. So I can move this, you know, keeping an eye over here on how many pixels I'm clipping. And I can move the, you know, there's, you know, 20 million pixels or whatever in this image. So if I flip a thousand of them, that's really nothing. Uh, so uh, you could see in the preview here. Uh, okay, to be conservative, I'll just flip half that. And there you go. And so now I would say I'm done with this image. So that's... Uh, more or less my scheme for images where I don't separate stars from uh, background, you know, from the target, like from a galaxy or a nebula or something like that. But uh, it has the Blurex and uh, GHS uh, and uh, synthetic luminance components to it. Uh, okay, so uh, before I switch to the next image, which will be a galaxy where I do separate out the stars. Uh, are there any questions or comments or any other things someone wants to say? Um, may I ask a couple of general questions that sure. I hope that not only you, but others can answer as well. Uh, By the way, um, is it okay if I, while you're asking them, I'm going to switch uh, to the other Pix Insight project, okay. unless you wanted to ask about this. Okay, so go ahead, fire. Go ahead. Um, so I know that um, in general, people that I've spoken to have said that for generating a flat, they typically use a uh, an ordinary, uh, uh, inexpensive Chinese, let's say, um, slight illumination panel. And <clears throat> at first that made sense to me, but then I saw ads on Bader Planetarium that they have a, a, a flat tool that is actually an electroluminescent panel. And the difference is that a regular <clears throat> ordinary panel, an inexpensive panel, even though it appears more or less white to the eye, it's really very few spectral lines. It's not a flat uh, 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 generation of light over many colors. It's, it's just a combination of a couple of spectral lines. And that in fact is also what's going on in fluorescent light bulbs is that they only generate a few lines and then, the, and then your eye thinks that it's white. Well, the beta is claiming that they could do a better job by using this electroluminescent panel that's generating true wide spectrum, flat white light. I want to know your and Francesco and other people's opinion of that. Is that just marketing or can that actually help? Well, I mean, I don't have an opinion on that. Um, I'm... I guess I'm using one of the cheap panels that you talk about uh, that you've mentioned, and it does seem to work. Um, it's possible, of course, there's a better approach. Uh, so if anybody else wants to comment.
Yeah, that seems to work for me too. Uh, I had problems when I was using a, a tablet for flats because uh, in that case, uh, the, the colors, the white from uh, the background LEDs are filtered uh, via the three RGB pixels. And so what you get is the combination of their spectra and was giving me some strange problems with the camera. But yeah, with the Chinese uh, panel, I didn't have any problem. Actually, I, I did what uh, something similar to what uh, Julien told us uh, in one of the previous presentation and I put an Arduino to control the brightness and it works pretty well. The EL panel, uh, I, the ones that I read about, they are kind of uh, weak in illumination. So they require a long, very long exposure for uh, um, for narrow band, I don't know if Bader has a, something better there. I didn't check on the uh, um, actual brightness value for the Bader panels, but um, it just, from a physics point of view, it seemed to make sense to me that if you're only pretending that you're generating white light, but in fact you're generating narrow spectral lines, and only a few of them that simply trick the brain by adding together to produce white in our brain, then I thought, well, then it's not really calibrating flat for all colors that could be presented at the um, sure. objective of the telescope. Yeah, I suppose with a mono camera, you don't care about uh, whether it's white or not. It only needs to be relatively uniform uh, in, the, in the band transmitted by the filter, right? Yeah, I think that... The my point of view, my two cents, is also that in the flat, uh, taking is not very important to have a white light. The important thing is to have a uniform light. And that's the more, the more important things. Yeah, so you're saying special uniform rather than spectral uniform. Yeah. Correct, correct. I thank yeah. you for, for that. I do. I thank you for the for that because I was concerned that maybe I would be missing something. Um, the other question I had was for specifically for high. I'm wondering, I noticed that the images varied from one to another and particularly I noticed the uh, um, refractor image that you presented had extremely tight, sharp, round stars all over the field and the um, uh, reflector uh, would vary from one image to another and also from one side of the image to the other. And I'm wondering if that could be a collimation issue or whether it could be a, um, a back focus issue or it could be a field flattener issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a field flattener on it. So, and I did have a field flattener on the, uh, refractor and the refractor i'm sure is collimated better than the rc i mean rc is a tricky thing to collimate yeah. so i don't tend to be a pixel people i mean i'm not this is not a knock on looking at the tight corners and all that i have no doubt that i could you know that this you know paolo and i uh tried to uh collimate this thing a year and a half ago and I haven't re recollimated in a year and a half. So I have no doubt that something like that could be improved on the uh, RC. Um, so that's what I really think it is. It's just the refractors are, you know, easy, you know, come factory collimated and you don't really have to recollimate and or that often or hardly ever. And RCs are a different animal. And also you have to consider that the RC is uh, more or less four times uh, longer focal, in terms of focal length of the other. So also the problem are amplified. Right. And the seeing, yes. Yes. in terms of tight stars, you know, the seeing is, you know, the, 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 the RC is uh, 0.3 arc seconds per pixel, which is ridiculous because my seeing is probably two arc seconds and or three, you know, and uh, the uh, refractor is closer to, you know, reality, you know, like it's probably a little over one arc second per pixel. Thank you. All right. And, and then, you know, there you have, you know, uh, uh, Blurex trying to <laughs> improve these things, right? 
uh, you know, so it's taking the, uh, you know, the uh, whatever distorted um, RC, I mean, they're all distorted, but let's say the more distorted RC, and then it's trying to uh, fix that data up in its neural net, which is an interesting thing. So anyway, let, let me uh, move on. I was, you know, anyway, and show the, um, the how, how I created this synthetic luminance, uh, the scheme that we came up with uh, a while back. Um, the idea being, look, I have this RGMB data and it has luminance in it. And then I shot, you know, 50% of my imaging time was that a little less, you know, less than 50% of the photons I would have thought is this RGB because uh, these channels are, you know, have smaller bandwidth than the luminance. But anyway, um, there's a significant number of photons coming in there. You think that I should be able to get detail from them as well, not just throw them away in the uh, LRGB combination. So the idea was to combine the luminance from the RGB with the luminance uh, that I shot. That was the hope. And so here's the way um, I did that. So like before, I'm going to, uh, see the linear fit should be set up for green. So like before, I linear fit the uh, uh, red and blue channels. Um, uh, to the green so that they're at the same level. And uh, like, like before, I'm going to combine the, the channels together and I have this RGB image over here. Let's, I'm having trouble only because Zoom is interfering with me. But okay, did it. And then there's this you can see it's it's anyway there it is what it is there's this uh recommendation i forget i read where where, where if you're going to do something like i'm about to do you uh make sure each channel contributes equally so i do that with this rgb working space process i think i'm also supposed to set the gamma to 1.0 um for now let's uh, move on um and now I have this uh, RGB image, and I'm going to extract the L from it. And so now I have two L channels. I have this L, which is from the RGB data. And I have my friend the L that we you know, pre-processed and, and shot the original L channel. And so more or less what I want to do is average these two channels, or at least this is what I've been doing. And how, so how do you average channels? Well, image integration effectively averages channels. The only problem with this is there's no add view um, button. There's just add files button. And it requires a minimum of four things, uh, not two. So here's what we do. We take this guy here and we save it as an XISF. And my convention is to save it in something called an MLRGB. And I'm going to save that in this directory, processing 23, overwriting the last time I did this. Okie dokie. And I'm going to do the same thing for my L channel, which is already on disk, but I don't remember where. So I'm going to save him. Yes, to temp L, sure enough. It's already done. Must have practiced this talk. And um, there you go. So now I have them. OK, whatever. So now I have them uh, saved to disk. And now I can use the Add Files button. And there's temp L and temp LRGB. And I read them both in. But since I mentioned that you need four of them, I add them again. And then we just do image integration, which with four images is effectively going to average them.
and I shouldn't get much in the way of rejection. I don't. And so then I look at this guy and there it is. And I call it, so that when I told you before I was using my synthetic, oh, I already have this identifier used. So I'm going to get rid of the old version of it. One second. There it is. Oh, just in case something happens. Okay, so here's my image integration, and I rename him Lsyn. And that's the synthetic L that we're going to use for the processing. So that's the technique to create my synthetic L. Again, it's you know pretty similar to my L channel. It's just that I've also added into it the luminance data sort of derived from my color um, my color channels as well. I don't need this guy anymore. Let me get rid of all these, or, or at least iconify all these things. And I'm going to start from scratch because I really don't need that RGB working space business either. So I don't need this previous one. So here we go. So let's, uh, I already uh, did the uh, linear fitting on the blue and red channels. So I don't need to do that. So I'll just do the channel combination. And here you go. Here's my galaxy. And we're going to call this image RGB. And now we're just going to do the same old processing we did uh, that I showed you before, uh, hopefully uh, quickly. And I think we'll probably uh, call this a day after that. So I'll solve. Uh, this time I don't have to bring it out, you know, from the menus. I'll just solve it by dragging it. And then I'll get the colors right over here. Again, nice line, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, there he is. The color is significantly better. I'm going to run DBE on both. And I've pre-done that. If anybody needs a lesson, you know, you can ask later on how to get these samples. I, uh, I uh, took Rob Files' suggestion of using a lot of these samples, at least when you're not interested in, uh, in you know, like I say, finding uh, lots of detail in, in background cl uh, clouds. So I used 40 samples across and up and down. Okie dokie. Let's see how this guy looks. I mean, there's some cropping I could have done, but we'll call it good. And I'll do the same thing for uh, DBE. I, I, I like, you know, if possible, I often crop late. Uh, so this was the synthetic L, same story. Okay, so we have our luminance, we have our RGB. I already did the color, so now it's just a question of uh, running these plugins to make it uh, less noisy and sharper. When I, you know, when it's not a practice process like this one is tonight, I would say running through all these steps will take me a couple hours. You'd think it would take half hour, but there's always some complication, you know, that gets you to think a little bit. But it's, it's not too bad. Okay, so as I said, now I'm going to make the images nonlinear. I'm going to combine 
the uh, oh, I'll, uh, the LRGB just the same way as I did before, uh, the LSIN into the LRGB, sort of putting back the RGB or, you know, using some of the RGB's data and the original L, and then move it back to linear, discard the synthetic L, uh, restretch it again, or not. Uh, yeah, well, I probably should have cropped the guy. Let me crop him a little bit. Uh, now it has all this funniness. Um, I'm not sure what that is, but it's not that important. All right. Okay, and now let's uh, separate the stars from the galaxy. A lot of times that you have to, uh, for whatever reason, it complains that it doesn't seem to remember the AI model and I always have to reselect the model. That must be a bug in Star Exterminator. It seems of all the exterminators, star exterminator is the slowest of the uh, processes, but it's not too bad. But, you know, by the way, I'm running on a Mac laptop, a MacBook Pro, so a pretty fast uh, laptop, but a laptop. And so you're seeing how much time these, these things take. Okay, so here you go. This is the RGB stars uh, image. What, what I call RGB stars, which is, you know, obviously just the stars extracted. And this is the uh, galaxy. Uh, I'm gonna make it a little bigger and just point out it did a good job. It typically does a good job. In my experience, slightly better than uh, Starnet++, but you could use that too. Um, you can see over here remnants of a star, you know, sort of the brightness parts. Uh, I used to pull it out of Photoshop, pull uh, this image out and, uh, uh, you know, um, correct this part of the background, remove, uh, you know, heal, if you will, uh, this uh, star uh, remnant out. I found that it doesn't make that much of a difference. You can probably see it, but... Uh, that anyway, it sort of worked out of my workflow. I could show you the difference uh, if you do that or don't. But anyway, there you go. So here is the galaxy, and there are the stars uh, auto stretched, but we're going to do a better job stretching them. And then the next step is to stretch. So I'm going to remove the uh, screen transfer function and then get to the stretching. And so here again, we're going to do that same trick uh, that Dave Payne taught us about removing the, uh, oh, there it is, got to find it, removing all that blank space on the left by clicking there, send to SP, pulling down on protect highlights, shifting this left, and then increasing the stretch factor until it comes down. And Hi. Yeah. Do you know if the sorry to interrupt? Do you know if the space to the left is that um, sensor pedestal or is that um, century light solution? I'm gonna guess it's sensor pedestal. Okay. I mean, I haven't done anything. No, it's a sensor pedestal would be removed by darks. Oh, okay. So light. probably light pollution. Okay. Okay. But there are no pixels there. I mean, there's you know like no. You don't have any pixel with the zero value because uh, there's a, a you don't have darkness. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. There you go. No darkness. Noise. Okay. Anyway, I've done that, and uh, it's religion for me. Uh, so here you go. I, I think I hit. Uh, I hopefully. <laughs> I believe I did. Right. I hit. Uh, well, let me check. I'll check the history explorer. I sort of lost my context. Uh, RGB, yes. So I've already done one stretch, and that stretch was just this silly little 
a, a thing that we just were talking about. So now we move to the real stretching. So I remember to hit reset. I zoom in a little bit. I set the stretch point, you know, SP here. Click sent SP, something I forget half the time. Uh, and then now we can uh, start stretching it. Um, okay, so same story. What Payne said was he always sets this to 15 and moves that up. Um, I don't know, I'm a little different. I, I mean, I, I know I'm never going to use a 15. So I always put it in the range, you know, three, four, whatever that uh, I, I tend to, you know, use. Let's try it around here. I'll stretch this a little bit. And then I guess for a galaxy like this, I'm, you know, looking at the, um, you know, like when I set, like here, you could see I'm setting the S point a little too high here, right? And we're losing some of the glow around the galaxy. And if I move it to the left, you know, the background is is lighter than I would like. So that's sort of the thing I'm looking at. You know, I yeah, something like this looks okay, honestly. Um, that's the sort of fudge factor there. And then these numbers, I don't know. That looks a little better to me. Um, anyway, it's it's playing around. It's probably not not mattering that much. You could probably see that that thing that I was talking about did come out a little bit. That that little galaxy came out nicely. Anyway, that's that for that. Now, uh, once I do that, once I have an okay first stretch, what I tend to do is use um, the two sort of, you know, artificial contrast things, uh, HDR, uh, MT, and local histogram. Uh, I am a little troubled by the fact that my RGB is black. So maybe I forgot to apply that stretch. Yeah, so I forgot to apply that stretch. So let me uh, do that again. I'm sorry. Um, so I set it all up and then I didn't apply it. That's a mistake. So uh, here you go. This guy set to M10. I had him around seven. I had him around two or three. Oh, I forgot to click this preview. There we are. Let me just play a little bit with uh, these numbers. Uh, okay, again. You know, you just don't want to start, you know, once you see that halo shrinking, you're uh, too far to the right on the SP parameter. But, you know, you do want to get the... I mean, that's the reason that the, these stretches are better because, you know, we're not stretching that part to the left where all the noise is. You're only, you know, you're stretching the parts after it a lot more. That's the advantage of the general hyperbolic stretch, I suppose. And I guess I liked it a little better with this is a little lower. Okay, so this is, I believe, where about where I was. And this time I remember to actually stretch it and get out of here. And then here we go. There's the RGB image. And as I said, I tend to like these two. Uh, so this is the way I have this one set up with eight layers to lightness, lightness mask. And I usually run it and see how it looks. Some of the times uh, it's a little too intense for me. And in, in, in this case, I think it's okay. But sometimes it's too intense. And what I'll wind up doing is, uh, you know, like uh, making a duplicate of, uh, it doesn't allow you to like do it 50% or something like that, at least as far as I can tell. So what I wind up is pixel math, you know, having half without and half with or something like that. But anyway, so there you go. So I have uh, uh, increased the contrast a little bit or whatever you want to call that local contrast with this. And I'm going to do a similar thing with the local contrast control local histogram, although uh, it, I tend to use pretty low amounts. So let's uh, again, uh, zoom into this. And I don't know, to me, it's, it's a pretty heavy, I mean, it's a nice tool to use just a little bit of, I don't know, how's that? We'll just use that, I don't know. Something like that. 
and go back to the galaxy. Okay, so there's our um, galaxy. And I would say that, you know, roughly I'm done with the galaxy. Some folks maybe could, could do more with that, but I'm going to call that a day and start working on the stars. So you may recall that I stretched, I mean, when I uh, did this, I separated the stars and I had, there should be an image somewhere I don't see called RGB stars. There it is. Doesn't look quite this ugly. It is a little green, interestingly, which I'm going to get rid of later. Um, so I'm going to undo the stretch and go into the uh, general hyperbolic stretch again. And for, I remember Francesco in his talk said he used six and two. You know, I think what, what happens is we find these numbers we like. And I don't know, is it, <laughs> Francesco, correct me. I don't want to put words in your mouth. That's it. <laughs> Okay, I wind up with, I don't know, maybe a little stronger uh, stretches. I don't know, maybe I, I have this, what I wind up doing, yeah, you know, like the two is, is not a bad target for me for that. But what I wind up doing is pulling this up. I, I like to see a lot of stars, you know, so like, for instance, this I think is understretched. There's a lot of stars you don't see at all. At least I don't on the screen. And now here, I start seeing all these dim stars. And then if I do too much, you know, then I get all these distorted, you know, especially probably because of my ASI 1600 camera distorted things. So I'm, you know, I try to find this region between, you know, you're seeing the dim stars and the real, you know, brighter ones aren't too distorted. So let's say something like that. So we'll just call that a day. I, there is not none of this, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of the um, the part on the left for the stars because I think the uh, star extraction has taken care of that and, uh, for us. Hi, for the stars, have you tried the selecting mode uh, color? Oh, yes, I, I forgot. You know, in fact, for both, I usually use color. Oh, yeah. And so I made a mistake there. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, I'm going to, that's a good point. Thank you. Just rush through that. So, you know, this has too much color, probably uh, setting the color mode to 100%. But uh, I don't know, let's say 25% looks okay to me on this image. Um, again, your, your taste probably uh, varies from mine, but let's say that's good. I'm gonna call that good. And then, uh, you know, yeah, that's the uh, stretching it again, which isn't a good idea. And I'm actually going to get rid of that green star there. Um, it's bugging me just by the SCNR program. And I'm going to call those stars stretched. I'm going to show you what I learned was uh, on this, how to you know realize, oh, I forgot something that I really wanted to do without spending all that time and restretching this a third time, because I'm always forgetting something I really wanted to do. So I go to the History Explorer. And first of all, you can pull out from the History Explorer this and keep alive and, and, and find all the hist, you know, find what you've done. And I'm just going to set him aside. And then I'm going to go to the History Explorer and go back to the point where I've done that, uh, you know, that first stretch just to get rid of the stuff on the left. And I set up uh, and then I'm going to double or, or I could do it here double click on this guy and now he is uh, stretching the we're back to you know before that main stretch where i forgot to put it in color and i do that and yes you could see it's a lot more colorful again too colorful okay but more colorful and we'll zoom in and okay maybe that's too much red but it would be nice to have some of it and so, you know, something like that, maybe in this case, half, uh, I'm okay with. So thank you, Francesco, for that. And that that's how I go back. And now, of course, I'm just going to uh, drag in the same uh, HDRMT and the same local histogram that I did before. And here I am. I'm done with uh, the uh, stretch of the galaxy. 
I'm done with um, stretching of the stars and I use uh, the uh, pixel math equation I learned from Francesco to combine them, which is this one here. Dollar T means the image itself. So I'm gonna drag this uh, pixel math over this image and basically, you know, not, not this image times not the stars winds up screening in the stars, I guess. So here we go. And that's pretty close to my final image. I think I still have, you know, I, I, I still have empty space on the left. Uh, and I bet uh, we'll take a look. And sure enough, you know, you don't need this. This is the kind of thing I could also get rid of in uh, Lightroom, but why not get rid of it here? You can actually see here how many pixels you're clipping. So, you know, some number like that is, I believe, not too harmful to the image. And there you go. And there's my, you know, much better uh, than last year's version of NGC 891. So I've been going on for 90 minutes. So I could do another M33, but the it's a very similar technique. The only thing I was gonna add with M33 is that it was an HA image. And what I did was uh, I, I, I guess I could skip ahead if people wanted, but I'm happy to end here. Um, all I did was stretch the HA and then mi mix the stretched HA into the uh, R channel of the stretched image uh, with the pixel math equation, but fundamentally the same kind of processing. So why don't I stop sharing here and, uh, you know, see if there are questions or comments and stuff like that. I'm back. What do you think? Are, are there, oh, I see there's some chat. Has that all been covered? Yeah, I think so. Okay, except that uh, Francesco went offline or something, or might have. Oh, that's a minute ago, so maybe not yet. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I because uh, I think that this is a, a nice um, sum, summing up uh, of all the previous talking, uh, uh, putting in a, let's say, real uh, world uh, cases of all the separate uh, talk about the various technique in more detail. Thank you again. Thank you, Paolo.